But as for our first guest, well, I'd like to give him a nice, big, long and glowing introduction. But if I did, I'm sure he'd just turn around and tell me to stop messing about. So here he is, the actor, writer, comedian, raconteur and a truly delightful man, Kenneth Williams. <laughs> worried about making a delicate I know, you steps, see, right? it's so yes. easy to yes. fall over and, and make a prat fall, as the Americans say. And I always think it's very important, if you're going to enter at all, to do it elegantly, don't you? Elegantly. Your elegant set, you'll see. True. Makes me feel quite shabby. <laughs> mm. I was just thinking about your, your new book. Here it is, Extracts from Your Personal Diaries. Um, quite glowing reports of all sorts of people and events in it. Is it a question of what you've had to leave out of it rather than what you've put in? Yes, the censors came into play because the publishers sent it to their solicitors, you know, and they read every line of it. And they, they cut out one passage, which I thought was a delightful one. It was one rather bibulous minister at the Foreign Office reception and, um, oh no, intoxicated, going up to a foreign guest and saying, Lovely, you lovely, you lovely creature in scarlet, dance with me. And the visitor turns around the apostolic delegate, and I think you're in no condition to dance with anyone. <laughs> I, I thought it was marvellous. They wouldn't have it, because I actually mentioned the name, and they said, no, it could be considered libelous. So, you see, when you come to actually print things, you have to be very, very careful indeed. Am I allowed to mention the episode with Noel Coward? The Which one? The first time you met him? Or? Oh, the first time I met him. Oh, that was when he came into the dressing room. He came into the dressing room. I didn't know it was him. A voice simply said Noel. And I thought it was somebody in the company laughing about, because the show had finished. And I was undressed. And I was on this sort of pole, which had warm water in it, because I believe in washing every part properly, you know, not, not doing it in a, in a haphazard fashion, you see. And so I took no notice. And the door opened. And, of course, it was coward. And I shot up, you see. And this pole of warm water was dispersed all over the room and my dressing gown got soaked and he said what on earth what on earth are you doing and i said oh well you see uh, i have an operation i have an operation i have to be very careful and he said my dear i understand perfectly it's piles <laughs> i've had the operation myself i discussed it in my book present indicative doubtless you've read it i know all about the horrors involved and i said no no and part of a pile and i said no no i said i had papili you see a surgeon told me what you got is papili and cars papili my dear it's an island in the south sea <laughs> and it turned out he was right it is i was all right i got it all wrong these medical things you ought to be very, very careful about. Have you always kept a diary? I kept a diary since I was 14, yes. Actually, it had disastrous results at first because I didn't realise you should put it away carefully. I'd left it out and I'd put in boring evenings spent with Mum and Dad and my father found it and said, Thank you, thank you. We're bores, are we? <laughs> I've provided a roof over your head. We're boring. And I said, You're not supposed to read it. Well, I did. He said, If I read any more like that, you'll get a bloody good idea. So... <laughs> After that, I was very careful. Some diaries actually have got a lock and key on the volume. It's a good idea. Well, reading through the book, I mean, I'm fascinated to see that you enter down a lot of dialogue that you either overhear or dialogue that you've been involved with. Well, I have overheard, reading. yes, I have overheard some delightful stuff. I was with George Rose outside the BBC, and this woman in the bus queue was saying to the other woman, and my dear, we were at her housewarming party, do you see, and I saw it lying there on the stairs for everyone to see. So Muriel found this... Um, this napkin, and luckily I had some cotton wool in the handbag, and we wrapped it up, you see, and put it back on the stairs, and for all I know, it's lying there to this day. <laughs> and of course, when the bus came, she can't even have found out what she was. That's really delightful. And I was with Maggie Smith once at uh, Baker Street Station, and the girl in front, a Madonna-like creature, very beautiful, the hair parted in the middle, Italian, um, said to this West Indian um, man in the booking office, she said, what's got a San Giovanni? And he said, sixpence. And I, when I got to him, I said, where's she going? He said, what's got a San Giovanni? St. John's Wood. And I said... Oh, yes, of course. San Giovanni, St. John, and Bosca Wood. And I thought, how marvellous that you could actually translate as quick as that. And he said, when you've been in this job as long as I have, you, you realise you've got to translate. You know, because London Transport's full of that. And I heard another man on a bus getting off, and the conductor had said, he called out, Regent Street, Piccadilly, Shaftesbury Avenue. And this man coming down the stairs said, Did you say Let's Be Avenue? <laughs> 
and the conductor. The conductor said, no, I didn't, but do you want to make something of it? And he said, no, not without Miss Strawberries. And got off. Completely illogical line. Not without Miss Strawberries. What does it mean? But I put it down in my diary. I write everything down straight away. We're seeing you've been on holiday and looking extremely healthy. Yes, I Tenerife. Yes, yes, I went to Tenerife, the Canary Islands. Have you, know. you kept the diary up to date while you were Yes, there? I put everything down about that, too. In fact, there was an enchanting episode there because a lot of little children come up to me in hotels because they've seen me doing things like Willow Wisp and Jack and Nori, and they come up and say, Do that voice, do that voice, do that, go on, do that voice. Say, say something, say that. I'll send the rubbish on that. So I'm with them a lot, you'll see. And one of these little boys I was talking to. His mother came out and told him, oh, she said, Darren, I told you, you should be in, you will have no cakes tonight, you will have no cake. You should have been in and washed and dressed for ready, ready for the meal. And you have not got dressed, you have still in a swimming costume. And she was very angry. And then I saw him the next day and I said, your mother doesn't talk like you. He said, no. He said, no, she's from Hamburg. <laughs> and I said, oh. Well, how is it then that your father is English and she's from Hamburg? He said, well, she came over, you see, to my dad's firm to do the typing, and then they started kissing. And I thought, what a marvellous, what a good synopsis, really. <laughs> Absolutely concentrated. Only a child can do that, you see. And they'll say things totally directly without diplomacy. He said to me, you look old. You look old in life, don't you? You look old. I think, yes, but I am quite getting on a bit. I'm pushing 50 cents. You know what I mean? I am. I loved it at the section I read in the paper this week where when you arrived with your mother that you were booked in as Mr. and Mrs. Yes, that's true. It made the papers, didn't it? I made a great scene in the forest. This is scandalous. This place is dreadful hotel. How dare you push me in a room with my mother? And they said, the, says the Mr. and Mrs. William. We thought the Mr. and Mrs. William have the same room. I said, we're not Mr. and Mrs. Williams. I, we're, well, we are, of course, actually. We are, aren't we? I said, we're mother and son. But apparently in Spain they think nothing about shoving you in the same room if you are related. But of course she doesn't want that. She said, you don't um, see my smalls hanging up in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> draw the laundry. Kenneth, you have this endless supply of anecdotes, and I'm wondering how much you embellish them as the years go on. I don't, honestly, because I think... Uh, I remember Stanley Baxter saying to me, you know, um, all comedy is the channeling of a private misery. And he gets involved, much, he's much more involved than I am with people, and he hears much more from people than I do, which is a very, very good listener. And he told me about a meeting, an extraordinary meeting he had with a very, very old man who was in this uh, lobby of a, a sort of chemist shop, and this old man was ranting on about illness. He was waiting for a prescription. And he said to Stanley, uh, my first wife, uh, my first wife died, and all during the dying, I had to nurse her, hand and foot, uh, waiting her hand and foot. And I swore after that I'd never marry again unless the woman was healthy. And then I met this... <laughs> yes. And, and I, I met this woman, this other woman, and she said she'd like to marry me. And I said to her, are you robust? He said, well, the wicked cow. She said, yes. She went down on her knees and said, Fred, I am robust. He said, what happened? She was ill within three weeks. I was nursing her and all. <laughs> and this rather callous dismissal of a whole series of marriages took place. And I thought that was delightful, but he actually has the capacity to stand and listen. I mean, if it was me approached by some old man saying, My wife, I'd say, Oh, yes, well, thank you very much. I'm very busy. And move away quickly. But Sally's always got that marvellous ability to get out of the situation. I remember being with him once. He was driving an open car. And this man on the pavement looked at him and he said, Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Now, wait a minute. No, no, no. Don't tell me. No, don't tell me. And Stanley drove off and said, I won't. <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant. The man was left in a haze of carbon bomb monoxide or whatever it is in the car. It's discharged. <laughs> you mentioned Stanley, and of course you've worked with all the big names, let's face it. But I know that Maggie Smith is a particular favourite of yours. Why, why do you respect Maggie so much? Mag has a most wonderful capacity for involving both the two masks, I think, the two masks, you know, the two masks which are always represented in the Greek symbol of theatre is one mask is crying and the other mask is laughing. And they are two sides of, in actual fact, the same coin. And here is a lady who can do both. Her Desdemona was...